So our guest today is Nicholas Norbrook, the Managing Editor of the Africa Report. Thank you so much for being my guest on Paris Live. It's a pleasure to be here. Today we're looking at a couple of stories. One of them is the mobile money business in Nigeria and how China is getting involved. We're also going to have an update on the general ambience in Angola, two years on from the election and where they're up to uh, there. So we'll begin perhaps with the Nigeria story. The article is entitled... China-backed Opay gets big on Nigeria's fintech opportunities. So my first question to you, uh, Nick, is what is fintech exactly, uh, and in particular in this context? What are we talking about? What's mobile money business? Well, uh, fintech covers actually an incredibly large range of things. So um, at its you know at its most Basic, um, it is a transfer of cash from one person to the other. And it's, you know, from, uh, they're, they're called wallets, digital wallets. Um, listeners will know uh, perhaps M-Pesa in Kenya made it famous, really, um, this ability to use your mobile phone to send money from one mobile phone to another mobile phone. Um, and actually, I mean, we sit here in Europe surrounded by, you know, uh, this fantastic gleaming studio here at RFI. Um, but actually, Europe is a bit of a laggard when it comes to mobile money. Africa is far in advance in terms of what you're able to do. Um, you know, real time uh, movements of money from one person to another, whereas here it might take three days for your bank to, to do the settlement. In Kenya, it's instantaneous. And an incredible amount of money moves around the economy, uh, especially in Kenya, like that. Um, Nigeria is a, a bit of a, a, you know, has has been slower uh, in the uptake of mobile money, but that is all changing. The big um, the big mobile phone company there, MTN, is now uh, has has got a, a mobile money license, so it's getting into the game. Meanwhile, there is uh, you know an absolute constellation of other fintech operators in Nigeria, which range from the very large to the to the much more modest. Um, one of the bigger ones, in fact, one of the ones which probably does deserve the, the title of, of unicorn, you know, the, uh, a tech company worth a billion dollars, is Interswitch. Um, they uh, have recently announced that they are, you know, going to receive about $200 million of investment from Visa. Now, you know, Visa itself, we know Visa and its competitor MasterCard. We know Visa, that that is fintech as well. That helps process payments internationally. And uh, Interswitch does a similar job for Nigeria and is also expanding um, into Africa. Um, now, you know, there, there is an, another um, fintech player called Opay. Um, they are linked to the Opera browser, which is a, a web browser and app, which was bought by Chinese investors um, uh, a few months ago, perhaps a few years ago, um, for about six hundred million dollars. And now, you know, their 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 um, uh, Opay app is being purchased um, by some Chinese uh, investors again, um, which you know is is a uh, an interesting change. We've seen an incredible amount of Chinese money go into infrastructure. There's been a lot of, you know, oil for road type deals which were signed, uh, especially over the last 15 years. And we'll get on to Angola in a moment. That's a very classic example of the first big waves of, of Chinese capital coming into Africa, which was really to lock down resources and, you know, build roads. You know, the, this um, this sort of second big wave we're seeing now is going into services, it's going into telecoms, it's going into, um, you know, consumer type products, which is, a, you know, a big change. And uh, I think everyone's readjusting to the fact that, um, you know, China is in it for the long term, it's it's not just you know trying to secure oil. It does see Africa as a place um, that is worth putting money in, especially into uh, mobile money. It's been such a success in Kenya. There's no reason it wouldn't be a success in Nigeria. I imagine is what they're thinking. Mm. So what does what does China want out of this? I mean, you've just mentioned that it's it's not just about uh, I mean getting a foothold in, in in the country. That seems to be something more. They're in it for the long haul. And and conversely, what are Nigerians getting out of it? What uh, how do they see this innovation? Well, I, I mean, I th there's a lot of pride in Nigeria at the sort of the 
incredible growth of the technology sector there. And, you know, we're, we're talking about this quite specific um, fintech, but there are lots of other technology companies. Um, Jack Ma, you know, the, the very famous Chinese billionaire who who launched Alibaba and is launching other um, trading platforms now within Africa, um, uh, recently had a, a net Netrepreneur Prize, I believe, which was won by a Nigerian uh, tech entrepreneur who was doing blood deliveries, um, which started in a place called CC Hub, one of the early uh, places where Nigerian tech companies were nurtured and you know, uh, brought brought to life, um, and it, I, I think that so you know there, there's a lot of pride that um, it's not just Silicon Valley companies who are now moving in to purchase Nigerian companies. It's also Chinese companies which are moving in to purchase Nigerian tech companies. Um, you know, and obviously there's a lot of uh, you know Nigerian um, uh, entrepreneurs who who want local money, Nigerian money to invest in it too, to keep some of the value in Nigeria. That's a slightly side debate, but it's certainly one that's that's going on. But it does, I think, you know, help us move away from this fairly uh, one-dimensional view of, of Chinese investors in Africa that we've had uh, exactly. until now. Mm, yeah. Um, are there any concerns for cybersecurity? and issues around uh, the technology that we are aware of uh, in the world, the surveillance, things like that? Um. I mean, that, that, that is absolutely uh, a question that's um, not been answered. Uh, there are many companies now who are um, looking to Africa as a place where regulations are so light touch as to be non-existent and... Um, you know, whereas Europe has really tightened up on security, um, Africa hasn't really uh, worked on on these kinds of things at all. And there is, you know, there's a you know a, a real debate to be had on who owns the data, who owns you know the data in various African countries, um, who is exploiting it, who's getting the benefit of it. Um, there 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 are various companies who offer solutions similar to what we see in China today in terms of facial recognition and, you know, uh, linking that to national databases um, with, you know, uh, on the one hand, the argument this is terrific for security. And on the other hand, you know, you know, this could also be used for less democratic purposes. Mm, mm. Um, so, uh Let's maybe move on to the next article. And you mentioned uh, just a moment ago that uh, uh, we're going to turn to Angola and China has uh, shown a lot of interest in, in Angola. Now, the article that uh, the Africa Report is looking at in this particular edition is entitled in Angolans Feel Let Down Two Years Into the New Presidency. Um, perhaps we could begin with uh, just reminding the listeners who the President Jao Lorenzo is and his background. How did he get to uh, to the leadership today because uh, it's uh, you know it's it's obviously uh, something ha people had great expectations for and maybe those expectations haven't been met <laughs> it's probably worth saying um, that you know Jao Lorenzo is is very much of the system mm. he isn't someone who uh, fought for a long time as an opposition leader and is now in power. He very much comes from the ruling party. Um, but I, th I think the optimism came from, I, th I think, the fact that very early on he took quite a few decisive moves um, which indicated he was taking the country in a very different direction. Um, and, you know, I, I, I wanted to highlight these these two articles, actually. One which we which we published online on theafricareport.com and one that we have forthcoming in our uh, next print mm -hmm. edition which will which will come out in December which is our big end of year Africa in 2020 edition um uh, and you know the 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 one we have online it it you know it does point to the fact that um a lot of angolans feel that that initial euphoria hasn't borne fruit Although um, uh, Lorenzo did s some, you know, reforms in terms of sidelining some of the, um, the the ruling family who had 
uh, pillaged the country in the previous few decades. He'd sidelined, um, you know, uh, the daughter, the son, who were in charge of the National Oil Company and the Sovereign Wealth Fund, respectively. Um, he also has, you know, allowed critics to speak a lot more freely. Um, you know, some very notable and tough critics who were facing prison under the previous regime are now receiving awards uh, at the presidential palace. So there has been a genuine change um, in the openness um, of, you know, what, what can be said. Um, uh, nevertheless, uh, the, the, the hard facts are in 2015, 2016, the bottom fell out of the oil market. Um, prior to that, Angola had, you know, it had been talking a good game about diversifying the economy, but had done nothing. Um, and so when that big oil crash came, the country was woefully underprepared. And, it, you know, in a way, it doesn't matter who you have at the helm, the country is going to go through an incredibly uh, difficult uh, moment. Um, um, and it, it, it provides a contrast, I think, the, the, the other article that what we're going to publish um, in, in our next print edition, which is really focusing much more on the oil sector itself. Um, and, you know, there, there has been a real change there. The way that, um, you know, he separated Son and Gol into, you know, the, the national oil company into the regulating part and the part which actually, you know, bids for contracts or, or you know, makes money. Um, so that's, you know, a big change. Um, he's, he's, trying to professionalize it um, and they've had a few uh, licensing rounds they've they've uh, done some road shows and you know whereas in the past the licensing rounds would be a very very opaque affair and you know a few well-connected businessmen and the Chinese would come out with the oil blocks um, now you know they're publishing all the names on their website they're publishing the model contracts on the website um, they're communicating you know it's possible to get answers to you know basic questions um, that investors had so so there has been a real change they, they've done things like allow um, the commercialization of gas you know, previously all gas just belonged to Sonine Gol, um, which wouldn't really use it, and so there was no incentive for for the other oil companies to do anything but flare it, which is what happens in Nigeria. You know, huge uh, columns of flame offshore, uh, gas just going up into smoke, helping to warm our climate mm. uh, as it happens. Now um, that gas can be uh, compressed, taken on shore. Um, and sold, and, and that's what's starting to happen, and, and that is a you know a real change. Likewise, a lot of the gas is now being used domestically for electrification projects. Um, so, I, I think there there will be a net, you know, a, quite a substantial net gain to the economy from this um, modernized uh, energy sector. Now, um, one of the broader points made uh, in the online piece, more critical, uh, was about this. IMF deal that Angola has struck, um, you know, which some see as a you know one of the real um, progress points of João Lourenço. He's managed to you know um, get a much more uh, um, um, coherent and transparent financial plan in place. Um, but critics say you know um, the track record of the IMF in these situations isn't very good. You know, it tends to say austerity first and, you know, we'll ask questions later. And that has led to, you know, various flame outs across the continent in the last 20 years. Mm. Um, and indeed, uh, in Europe, um, where we were much more IMF-like in our response to the 2009 crash, we took a decade to recover, whereas America was, was you know, for all its talk about being a free market, America was much more, um, you know, Keynesian, if I can... Uh, caricature it and you know didn't cut everything to the bone immediately um and they bounced back much quicker as an as an economy mm. uh, as an economy so you know uh so i th i think perhaps angolans are are maybe correct to be skeptical at the very least about uh the imf's projects mm. and uh so just quickly what are the challenges uh, the country is going to face going forward there's obviously still a, a bit of this problem with the corruption maybe it's not completely been dealt with but uh what are the other issues? Well, I mean, I, th I think that those are, you know, the, the, the issues around diversification, I think, are, are absolutely critical. Angola has the same uh, demographic um, 
explosion that many, many countries across the continent have. You know, their ability to um, provide jobs for the youth will be, you know, an incredibly important part of the future. Um, but the, you know, this this corruption element is is not something that can be wished away. There are very strong entrenched powers in Angola, you know, which which um, which are impossible just to to get rid of overnight. Um, and I'm not even sure that Lauren Shaw wants to because some of his power depends on keeping them on side. Um, that will be problematic in the near term future because um, there is a large privatization round. Sonangol itself will be privatized in 2022, but there's another 150 or so other com uh, companies within Angola, state owned, which will be privatized. The, the danger is. Um, that you create a situation like Russia, where you you know you recreate you know the the same power bases as, as were dragging the country down before, um, will Angola go the path of Russia and create uh, a new series of oligarchs, uh, or will it do something uh, a bit different? I think all eyes will be on that. Well, thank you very much to Nick Norbrook from the Africa Report, the managing uh, editor, for being my guest on Paris Live. Most welcome.